So, um, so a, a, a couple of a couple of uh, weeks ago or so, Chris has been doing a lot of Chris has been doing a lot of studying scripture, and she's been getting closer with her walk with the Lord. And her desire was to get rebaptized. She was baptized when she was young, but she wanted to get rebaptized to let everybody know that she is in fact a follower of God. And she wanted to rededicate her life and follow through with that. She says, that, as she told me, she says, I'm a new creation and I want to show the world, I want to show you all uh, that in fact she's a new creation. And so she wanted to get rebaptized again. And so that's the reason why she comes this morning. <coughs> Marissa, do you give your life to Jesus Christ? I baptize you, my sister, Marissa Lewis, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's all turn to page uh, 526. Let's all stand. And you're doing a great job. Wasn't that great? I'd love to see uh, that. Too. Thank you. 
PBS and, and the bigger children. We talked about uh, Destination Dig, and it was all about searching out for the truth. And we compared science to the Bible. And what we did is, what we find is, science proves the Bible's truth. And you don't have to be exclusively one for the other. A lot of times people think that, well, science is separate and the Bible is separate and they contradict and all these kind of things. But what we found out this last week and what we're going to study a little about this morning is actually science complements the Bible. The, why? Because God created all things, including science. That's right. Amen. Right? That's right. So science is his creation. What about history? History is here. And history, everything you know about history, you can thank God because God created history. God created all things. As we open up the Bible this morning, 
and read directly from God's Word from Genesis, the first chapter, as this continues on, what the, the children have been, have been talking about at VBS. But God created all that we see, all that we study, all that we go towards, everything that we have, all points towards God. In the beginning, God. In your Bibles, the Genesis portion is not going to be up on the television screen behind me, so you'll need to rely upon your Bibles in front of you. I'll be reading it as well. In the beginning, you see, God created His earth for His glory. Let me say that again. God created His earth for His glory. Day one. There's seven days that we're going to break down. You guys know this. You, we're going to go through this kind of really rather quickly. But, but when you take a look at day one, God created day and night. Genesis 1, 1 through 5 says this. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible right now for Genesis. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Verse 4, God saw that light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, and then there was morning. One day. God created day and night. I want you to understand here is when we take a look at this, they all coincide with one another. You see, God in the very beginning, God created this, uh, 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 this, this world. Uh, God created the, the housing project, if you will. And then later on, God creates the inhabitants of this housing project or of this, this project that we have. Uh, that's going to continue to fall over there. We've been fighting on that all week, so you can just ignore that. And we're not going to have Kendall probably go ahead and take it down right now. So it kind of is, it, it's, like a, it's like a scab. You kind of keep picking at it, pick, keep picking at it. And it, it, it kind of like drives you crazy. So, yeah, we'll go ahead and we'll take that down. But and for day one, God created day and night, Genesis 1, 1 through 5. Day two, God created seas. And skies. Let's read here in verse 6 through 8. Then God said, Let there be an expanse between the waters, separating water from water. Verse 7 So God made the expanse and separated the water under the, under the expanse from the water above. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above the expanse. And it was so. Verse 8 God called the expanse sky. Evening came, then morning, the second day. So day one, God created day and night. Got day two, God created sea and sky. Day three, God creates land and plants. Verses 9 through 13. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And so it was. God called the dry land earth. And the gathering of the water he called seeds. And God saw that it was good. Verse 11. Then God said, let the earth produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And it was so. Verse 12. The earth produced vegetation, seed-bearing plants according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed, and it's according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And evening came, and morning came, the third day. Three days, three days God has planted this. God has created this. Out of nothing, God created this. I want you guys to think about this as we're, we're talking about this right now. This is just a small little exercise. But if you were in a dark room and you closed your eyes, and if you were in a dark room and you closed your eyes, you couldn't see anything, which was what was here before God created all things. Now, you had to, if you closed your eyes and you just pitch black, you couldn't see anything. And now you are charged with creating things. How do you do that? 
why does that happen? How in the world could th could this all kind of be there together? And and you and I wouldn't even have a clue, even to, to even get started at all. I say that because I want us to understand the infinite wisdom of God. As God has created all these things, and He creates earth, I, I want to hit the pause button a second on this, and this is absolutely amazing. When you look at sheer science, God created our galaxy, a galaxy in this certain order around the sun that we gravitate around. Do you guys realize that if the earth was just a few degrees closer to the sun, that we would all burn up? Life would not exist upon this earth if God had created our earth upon our orbit around the sun just a few degrees outside the orbit that we live in now, then we would all freeze to death. The waters would freeze, you and I would freeze. So the exact orbit then in which it occurs right now is the creation of God. God had a plan, Amen. a purpose. It, not by circumstances, not by happenstance. I do not believe in the Big Bang Theory that, that this is all circumstance and happenstance. I believe God created this. I think there's a created being. Amen. I was telling the church last night uh, uh, that uh, if, if, you know, if, I, I heard this, I, this is not mine, I've heard this said uh, uh, many times before. But those that believe that something was created, something beautiful was created, you and I were created out of nothing, um, just by happenstance, by all the things, the lighting and that kind of stuff. Uh, imagine this. Imagine a junkyard. The junkyard between from here to I go home, there on the, the corner of Styles and the, the, uh, the, the Lovington Hops Highway. Imagine a tornado passes right through that junkyard. Those, that's happened many times before, not necessarily that junkyard, but junkyards around the world. You've never seen a Ferrari car pop out on the other side. <laughs> if you have, I want to know about it, I'd like to go to this junkyard. <laughs> not happening. Because chaos ensues, and for something to be that intelligently designed on the backside to happen, I think you have to have more faith in being an atheistic viewpoint than you do in a creator, personally. But can you imagine that? The, the heart beats inside of you right now, the, 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 the world in which God has created right now, if, if it was just a few degrees one way or the other, life would not be sustainable upon this earth. Yeah, That's amazing. You know what else is amazing to me is our human eye. The human eye, I don't know if you've ever studied the human eye, but there's so, it's so, so delicate. There's so many pieces to the human eye for you and I to see God's creation as we see it right now. And for that to be happenstance, happenstance circumstance, uh, I don't get it. When I see a beautiful design, to me that points to the designer, the creator, God the Father. Amen? Let's continue on here in Scripture. In verse, uh, in, in, in the fourth day, God created moon and stars. Verses 14 through 19. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky and separate the day from night. And they serve as signs for seasons, for the, for, for the days and years. Verse 15. They will be lights in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights. The great light to rule over the day and the lesser light to rule over the night as well as the stars. Verse 17, God placed him in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth to rule the day and the night. Also to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and evening came and morning came. And that was the fourth day. Day five, God created fish and birds. Verses 20 through 23. Then God said, let the water swarm with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth from the expanse of the sky. So God created large sea creatures and every living creature that moves and swarms in the water according to their kinds. He also created every winged creature according to its kind. 
And God saw that it was good. God blessed him and said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the sea and let the birds multiply on the earth. God created this to go into what he created, which was the water, the seas, the sky, everything works in together. The lands, the plants, the, the moon, the stars, the, the, the sun, everything that had to be created in order for things to grow, to live, to sustain life, God has created. Then on day six, God creates animals and humans. <clears throat> Verses 24 through 31. Then God said, let the earth produce every let the earth produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that crawl, and the wildlife on the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. So God made the wildlife on the earth according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and the creatures that crawl on the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Verse 26. Then God said, Let us, who's us? Just determined that earlier that God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, who's here before the earth was formed. Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the uh, over the fish of the sea, the birds of the skies, and the livestock, and the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl. On the earth, verse 27, so God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. And he created them male and female. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, you and I are created in the image of God. You and I are created wonderful, beautifully made. We're made by our creator. Now, what does that mean to us? Well, let's just make that real personal. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes many of us hate ourselves. We don't like ourselves. You look in the mirror, you see all the flaws. You see all the things that you like to change. And some things are good to change. Losing a little weight, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. Being more active and healthy, you know, those kind of things, that's a good thing. But sometimes when you look in the mirror and you just don't like the person that's living inside that, that body, that cell, that's a wrong thing. You see... We are called to love God, and God made you specially in His image. And so we to love who you are. Not in the boastful and pride way, in a way in humility, but you love who God created you to be. And that's a hard thing for some of us to do. Because we are critical by nature, especially to ourselves. We'll tear ourselves down. But God made you in his image. Continuing on verse 28. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, Look, I have given you every seed bearing plant on the surface and on the entire earth and every tree uh, whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you for all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, for every creature that crawls on the earth, everything having the breath of life, I have given every green plant and food. And it was so. Verse 31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Evening came and morning came, and it was the sixth day. You see, ladies and gentlemen, God's design was intentional. He, this was, didn't catch him by surprise. And so if he created all this in such an orderly fashion, it shouldn't come to any surprise to us that nothing could catch his God off guard or by surprise. Everything lines up with what God has already foreseen. He knows what's going on. When things happen in your life, God knows what's going on. He knew it even before you did. You see, everything that takes place upon this earth, God sees in advance. God knows. He, he knows what you're going to go through. We're going to relive it later on about, about how even when you go through heartache and turmoil and despair, God's still there. But I want us to, as we, to focus in on this. God created. God created everything for the good. He created this world for the good, for, for you and I to have, to enjoy. And what happens? 
We mess it up. We mess it up. How do we mess it up? Because just, just like anything else, as long as things are going good in your life, hey, uh, uh, you, you got you got things rolling around in your life, everything's perfect, and God provided this beautiful earth with all these beautiful colors and all the things that you have, and then all of a sudden, things going good, and when things are going good, you kind of seem to sometimes walk away from God because you forget the goodness of God. Have you noticed that whenever you're down and out and something really smacks you right in the mouth, that's when you rely upon God or you run away from God. But if you rely upon God, that's when, boy, my faith is going to walk with you closely. And then you get that mountaintop experience. You're going to get a reprieve. Something happens where you can take a deep breath and then you kind of keep on a trucking. And that's when sometimes we walk away from God. We forget about His goodness. That's a problem. That's a problem. That's exactly what takes place here in Genesis. If you'll flip over with me, please, to Genesis, the sixth chapter. We see here God created these things for his children. For God created it for the, all these wonderful things for us to enjoy, to have, to, to love, to be able to, you know, the rich, the rich fruits and vegetables, all the things, the animals to look at. It was such a nice place. And then we walk away from but isn't that human nature, it seems like? That we walk away from God? And then we read here in Genesis, the sixth. I'm getting ahead of myself. Flip so over with me to Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Hebrews, the 11th chapter. You see, God created His earth for His glory, and God created everything for His purpose. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verses 1, 2, and 3, says this. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Verse 3 is what we're going to key in on here this morning. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. You see, ladies and gentlemen, God created all this out of nothing, as we've been talking about here. But when we see, you know, we read this verse, verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. God spoke it into existence. By faith we understand here that the universe was formed out of God's command. So what, we have seen, not, what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Now I want us to understand, before we go any further here, to understand this. And this is where a lot of people get tripped up. To be a good Bible trivia thing for you. Was God a created being? Was God a created being? And that's something that, that, that uh, uh, theologians talk about from different times. Was God a created being? Because the people point to point to, to Mary. Was God a created being? Ladies and gentlemen, God was not a created being. And that's extremely important for us to understand today. Jesus Christ was not a created being through, through Mary. Yes, he was born through Mary, but he was not a created being. If he was a created being, then something that would be created, he would be no different than you and I today. That's the extreme importance. If God was a created being, if God, uh, Jesus Christ was a created being through Mary, he would just be just like you and I. Jesus Christ existed before the earth was here. Amen. It's extremely important for you to understand that because that's one of those things that people talk about all the time. And this is a hotly contested issue, but it shouldn't be. Because when we read over there in Genesis 1, you talked about the Trinity. The Trinity was there in the beginning when God's talking about that. He's talking about the Trinity. If he's talking about the Trinity, then Jesus Christ was not created in the New Testament. He existed before the world began. Amen. There's some religions out there that get those things flipped. When they get those things flipped, they speak about Jesus in error. 
Jesus, fully God, fully man. Jesus existed before the earth was formed. Very important that you understand that, Bethel. The people on earth, just like I was talking about a while ago, the people on earth, they walked away from God. Life was good and they walked away from God. In Genesis 6 and Genesis 7, it talks about how about the people turned their backs on God. They sinned against God. They went away from God because they thought that they had it all. They did not need God anymore. Does that ring a bell? People walking away from God didn't think that there's a need for God anymore. Think about this in the world that we live in today. Ah, there's no need to go to church. There's no need to, to, to read the Bible. There's no need to follow God. I don't even believe that stuff anyway. There's no need. There's no need. There's no need. That's the sentiment in the world in which you and I live in today. This is not the first time. When you read Genesis 6 and Genesis 7, the same exact thing took place. There was no need. There was no need to follow God. God, when you read Genesis 6 and 7, God gets irritated at that. He gets angry at that. He gets angry because the people that he made to commune with him fallen away and decided to follow their own interests, their own desires, their own gods, their own lifestyles. I'm going to do what is good for me. And then God gets angry. God gets angry and decides that he's going to wipe mankind from the face of the earth. The very thing that he created Think about that. As God had put in the time and the effort, and as he, he put all this stuff into creating, the, creating the, the earth, praise God that he already, that, that Jesus was already there, part of the, the Trinity. If not, you and I wouldn't have any hope for today. But then what takes place? The flood takes place. Noah and his descendants were spared. We talked about that this week in Vacation Bible School. And as Noah and his descendants were spared, and they populated the world, and then you and I are, are the repopulation, reboot, if you will, from that time. And then they decided to walk with God again. They saw that, that the need to walk with God again was good. You see, they had a catastrophe happen in their life, and then all of a sudden, we're going to get right with God. We're going to walk with God. Life is good. Ring a bell? And then, life was good for a long period of time, and then... I don't have time for that. Let me go do my thing. Leave me alone. God, I don't need you. Leave me alone. And then, flip over with me please to Jeremiah, the 29th chapter. Jeremiah 29. What takes place here is they walked away from God. They, God's chosen people, once again, you see they were destroyed by water the first time, and then they came back and they, they walked they were walking with God and they decided to get away from God again, and God gives them chance after chance after chance and says, hey, you guys need to turn back to me. And they said, ah, we got this. I don't have to go hunting and fishing on Sundays. I don't need to spend time with you, God. I can go and do my hobbies on Sundays. I don't need to spend time with you, God. I can go, you, I, hey God, I can follow you when I'm hunting arrowheads in the middle of nowhere. I don't need to hang out with you, God. I don't need to learn more. I know all about you. I don't need to spend time underneath a, a, a Bible-believing uh, teacher. I don't need to go to Sunday school. I don't need to go to church. I, I don't need to do all that stuff. I don't need that, God. I'm, I'm good. Me and you are like this. The whole time you're drifting away from God and you don't even know it. And you're drifting and you're drifting and pretty soon you're so far away you say, oh, I don't, God, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And you drift off. And if you were a believer to begin with, you backslid. And that's tough. God's not good with that. If you didn't know him to begin with, then you were a false convert and you walked away because you didn't know. Those, both those things happen. 
And as that happens, we allow stuff in our world and our lives and that kind of stuff now to continue to get in the way, get in the way, get in the way. And so God sends in the Old Testament, God sends here prophet after prophet to tell the people, to beg the people, to cry out to the people. And he said, to tell, to tell the people, repent, turn from your wicked ways. And they all said, you don't understand. I got my own thing with God. I don't need to go and hear the scriptures read to me. I don't need to study the scriptures. I don't need to go and do whatever it is. The same thing that took place uh, thousands of years ago, uh, 4,000 years ago or so, is the same thing that takes place today. That's right. But God, He was merciful then. He spared Noah. It didn't sound like He was merciful. But He still spared Noah and his family. Therefore, the repopulation that you and I, you and I are from Noah that went through Adam and Eve. So God was merciful. And that's the reason why you're here today. If not, he could have wiped everything out and just said, I'm not doing that. Amen. So that's a merciful God. Amen. Next, he continues to give people time and time and time again, calling out to people time and time again. We read, God created everything for His purpose. God created everything for His glory. And God reaches out to His people. But they must do something. You see the remnant of Noah repopulating the earth. The people walked away from God again. They sinned against the holy God. They did not listen to God's prophets that warned them time and time again. And then what God was going to do is God was going to punish them. God gave the world a promise. And the promise was this, that he would never flood the, the world again. So what did he do? He gave us the rainbow. The rainbow is Christians' promise, God's promise to us. doesn't go for anything else. It's God's promise to us never to flood the earth again. When you see a rainbow in the sky, that is it. People can take their own intent on different things and that kind of stuff. But don't steal my promises from God. Other promises from God is this, as we read in Scripture. You see, God, what He did was He punished the people. There's always punishment. Whenever you sin against a holy God, there's always some accountability. And what He's going to do is He sends His people to, to, to Babylon in captivity for 70 years. And then He promised them a few things, though. So as they went, and we read here in Scripture, Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, Verses 10 through 13, 10 through 14 here. Jeremiah 29, 10. You see, God is sending them into cap captivity. Uh, there's going to be punishment because they've sinned against the holy God. But instead of God wiping them out, He makes them a promise. He makes a promise to the Israelites, God's chosen. He says this. This is what the Lord says in verse 10. This is what the Lord says to 70 years are completed. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. Even after his disappointment, God promised to restore the nation of Israel and bring his people back to the promised land. Even after the disappointment. Ladies and gentlemen, that should be great news for you and I. Because we disappoint God. We've disappointed God. We'll continue to disappoint God. The people here disappointed God. But God did not give up on them. Verse 11. Which, one of the, which is one of the most misused verses in the whole Bible. I, I can't tell you as a high school teacher how many graduation ceremonies that I have been through. And every gra graduate has on their Jeremiah 29 11. Every announcement that you get sent out, all these kind of things, and it's taken out of context. You see, the the plan here is 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 to the promise here is to the people of Israel, but this is what God says here: For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. You know my heart: plans to prosper you and not to harm you; plans to give you hope and a future. This is what God is saying here. 
God promised them not doom and gloom because that's what they deserve. Sinning against the Holy God did not promise them that, but instead promised them hope and a future if they did something, though. They had to turn away from their wicked ways. And they had to walk back to God. Verse 12. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You get that? God's not forcing them to do it. God gives us free will. In the very beginning in the flood, God could have forced all those people and said, I made you, therefore I'm going to, if I made you, I created all this stuff, I'm going to create you to follow me and not give you a free will, not give you a mind to go do your own thing. But instead, he did not do that. He gives you and I a free will to follow him or not, to choose what you're going to do with your life. Amen. And then here he's talking to the people. He says, look, I will restore you if you call upon me and turn from your wicked ways. Today, ladies and gentlemen, the same offer is true for us today. If we would call upon him and turn from our wicked ways. Now you notice this. You can't walk with God while holding hands with the devil. It doesn't work. So what happens is we have to we have to, just like the Israelite people here. God tells the Israelites, if you will call upon me, if you will turn from your wicked ways, if you will. You see, God doesn't make them. They have to choose to do this. He's going to make them prosperous. He's going to make them the, the not harm come to them and those kind of things. He's, he's going to take care of them, but they must do something. Now, this is not, a, this is not necessarily a, a get-out-of-jail-free card. This doesn't mean that, that they're going to go through life uh, uh, scot-free, that everything's good. That's not what this is saying. It's basically saying that, that look, I'm not going to turn my back upon you. You've turned your back upon me, but I'm not going to turn my back upon you. But you've got to do something. Verse 12, you need you if you then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Our BBS verse 13, verse 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Verse 13, the fantastic verse. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You see, God promised to hear the prayers of his people. However, the people had to call upon him first. They had to seek him first with all of their hearts. But I want you to notice something here. Something that I really didn't get until I studied this out. You notice it. The captives... Still had to go and do 70 years and in captivity. The Israelites still had to go do 70 years. It would have been great. It would have been great if they said, all right, God, let, we're going to give a heart to you right now. We're going to turn from you right now. Life's going to be good right now. Uh, I'm going to do just a little bit of time, if you will. And then, hey, bring me back to my promised land. God didn't make that happen. They sinned against the Holy God. They had to pay the price. That's right. There's always consequences to sin. They had to go and do 70 years. What does that mean? That means some of their parents didn't make it back to the promised land. Matter of fact, most of them didn't. Their children, the promises that God gave them, their children actually were the ones that started to go back in waves. Not all at the same time, but in waves. And what did they do? They got back. Some got back to the promised land. They were like, all right, God, we're going to worship you. And others said, I'm going to worship you. And then they forgot about him all over again. It took other prophets to come over there and to get him back on the right track. But I want you to notice here, ladies and gentlemen, that if God would have restored them probably right then and there, they probably wouldn't have, they probably wouldn't have decided to follow him again. Because it's like anything else. It's like human nature. 
When you were a kid and your mom and dad told you don't do something, well, depend upon the severity if they told you not to do something, that's how, that's how much you thought about that. If they said, I know for me, well, I never got time out. There was not a such a thing when I was a kid, no time out. <laughs> you know, that's a new thing. But when I was a kid and Jimmy Charles don't do something and got busted, hey, I, the severity was there. I understand not to do that. But depending upon how hard the, that, I got, that I got busted, right? Then you kind of learn. But imagine this, the same thing, isn't that the same thing with us today? It was that the, the, the promised land had to go, the, uh, the people had to go for 70 years before they came back. But what about us today? You and I still have to, to do that same thing. Sometimes God allows us to go through the wilderness. Sometimes God allows us to go through heartache and turmoil. Understand that God did not say, hey, okay, you guys are going to repent right now. I'm going to go and bring you back seven hours later. Doesn't happen that way. 70 years. So when you and I go through our wilderness, sometimes it's God, you, God allowing us to do that because we have done something that we shouldn't have done. But not always. But sometimes that happens. Sometimes it's our own choosing. And we blame the devil. And God's like, don't blame the devil. You're the dude that did it. And sometimes God's just trying to teach us. But at the same time, I believe the same promise to us today is the same promise that he gave to the Israelites. Same exact thing. That if you'll turn from your wicked ways, and if you'll call upon me, and you'll pray to me, then I will listen to you. And if you seek me, you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. In verse 14, he goes and he continues to say that I will be found by you. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, you and I this morning, we have a choice. In those times of old, they decided to walk with God. Then they got away from God. They got the flood. Then, as time goes by, they they, they walking with God. And they walked away from God. Then they got the 70 years captivity. And you can continue on and on in Scripture. Today, you and I have a choice as well. You and I can continue to follow God or choose to follow God, I should say. And there's going to be a friend we have in Jesus upon this earth. I think sometimes we, we, we say, okay, I'm going to follow God. And we automatically skip to eternity. And that's awesome. But we've got a huge life to live right here. And that life to live right here, Jesus is that forever friend upon this earth that we have. And then, and then, whenever we leave this earth as a believer in Christ, wow. Eternity with God the Father. But just like God has shown all throughout his word, those that reject him always find consequences. The eternal consequence for rejecting Jesus Christ is punishable by hell. It's a place that as a believer in Christ, I don't want anybody to go to. But it's not my choice, it's yours. So we have to decide, just like the men of old, what are we going to do? Are we going to decide to follow God and walk with God or walk away with God? It's our choice. God created you for a purpose. It's more than that. as we understand the complexity of what God has done. And we look around and we see marvelous things. As you close your eyes and you can go back in your mind of precious memories as God has, God, God has given you in your life. And you thank God for that. Thank God for the memories that you have of loved ones. Thank God for memories that you have that that God has in your life gotten you through the most difficult times that you never thought would ever be possible. 
if you're here this morning and you've never decided to follow Jesus, let today be that day that you give your life up and give it to Him. You see, God created you. If He created you, don't you know that He loves you so much? You know, some of us, we need to rededicate our lives to God because we've been walking away. We walked away and we said, I don't need this. I don't need you, God. I don't need you here. I don't need you here. But the reality is we need Him. Each and every day we need Him. If Bethlehem's where you need to call church home, you come. The altars are open for you to pray. You'll be obedient right now to God. As we sing.